Is my cue? Yep. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, panel on in invasive species and uh, in real life and literature. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick uh, because uh, this will be fun. Um, let's see, this one, there we go. Um, so <clears throat> we got a, a, panel, a panel of scientists, uh, myself included, um, uh, from different disciplines. It's, I think it'll be a really fun interdisciplinary uh, discussion about invasions of different kinds and common principles between all of those. However, before we, before we get started, um, we have to remember that, um, you know, this really is motivated by science fiction and, uh, and, and I'm just gonna put up a, an example of potentially extreme examples of, uh, of, uh, of invasive species management here. Uh, I was tempted to call, actually call the title "Nuke the Site from Orbit," but that's not uh, that 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 wouldn't really. Uh, there it was too it was too long. It, it, what I what I wanted to do. So, um, <clears throat> when I started uh, this discussion, this, I thought of a number of of uh, in, invasions, alien invasions over of the history of science fiction, and this is just a a, a small sampling. Uh, one of the original ones, of course, is H.G. Wells. We have to think of that though as. I think a <clears throat> the world of the worlds as there are two invasions that happen there. One is the aliens come to us, and then the germs invade the aliens. So we got two different events going on there. Then of course you know body snatchers in 1956, okay. quote you know red scare kind of thing, uh, and then it's another it's really slides we can't see them. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought I had that shared. Okay. Here, is, is, is this visible? Oh, there we go. All right. Okay, no, no, no. there we go. So this is visible now. Um, <clears throat> so you got War of the Worlds, uh, Body Snatchers, and, uh, and another very interesting people that got to some of the, one of the questions that I saw pop up in the chat uh, is this uh, uh, Octavia Butler Xenogenesis uh, uh, series. Um, and then of course, the one we all love and you know, Independence Day and various other things like that. So. What we've done here is, um, and then uh, this really was brought home to me and how, how critical this is in our ecology here. When I did, I bought a house here in Edgewood in Maryland and did a quick inventory of the invasive species that have colonized my very small yard. And so here's a sampling of these. Uh, this is not a complete list, but it is a significant contributor to the plant, the, the plant abundance in my own yard. Uh, and the one that really makes me want to nuke the site from orbit is the is the knotweed, but we'll get to that later. Um, but anyway, what we have what I've done is we've gathered a panel here of scientists, and uh, I want to give everyone a chance to get to, to introduce themselves. I'm a, I'll start. I'm, I'm Sandy Gibbons. I'm a research microbiologist for the U.S. Army at uh, at Aberdeen Proving Ground uh, in the in the uh, in the DevCom Development Command uh, uh, Chemical Biological Center. Uh, I've been there about 12 years and I work in the area of synthetic biology and biodefense and, and that sort of thing. Um, so why don't we start, uh, Ted, why don't we go with you? We'll go in order of, of, uh, of, dis of the discussion uh, session. So Ted. Uh, hi, I'm Ted Weber. I'm an ecologist with degrees in systems and wetland ecology, currently working on climate adaptation for defenders of wildlife. And I'm also a speculative fiction author um, I have an alternate history novel, Born in Salt, that just came out this month, and a near future cyberpunk trilogy, um, the last uh, volume, which came out last fall. Um, and my website is tcweber.com. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, thanks. Julie? So, hi, I'm Dr. Julie Urban. I'm an evolutionary biologist. I'm a faculty member in the entomology department at Penn State University. And by training, I study this obscure group of sap feeding insects called plant hoppers. And, and I'm fascinated with their coevolution with multiple bacterial endosymbionts that I'll tell you about, that they house in organs that can't live anywhere else. And so I went from doing some of the most, you know, basic kind of esoteric research to now there's a, a plant hopper that's an invasive in, in the Baltimore area, the invasive spotted lanternfly. And so I've been, I'm leading a $7 million grant with 37 other faculty and extension agents trying to uh, control this beast. And it's interesting um, how uh, learning about the basic biology has significant research applications for control. Oh, 
Oh, great. Adrian, it's great to see you after a number of years. Uh, Adrian yeah, and I used to, we used to collaborate together when I was a postdoc at UNC. So uh, I'll go ahead. So I'm, I'm Dr. Adrian Cox. I'm a professor of cancer biology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I study all things RAS, which is a protein that is in its normal form required for life and all normal cell functions. And if you change a single letter of its genetic code, then it turns rogue and it can both cause and potentiate cancer. Um, and <laughs> picking up on Julie's comment about very basic information can have uh, practical aspects. Um, we study both very basic things on how does RAS do all these things? And then we also study how targeted therapeutics that have only recently been developed against this formerly undruggable creator of invasive cancers, um, how, how, it, how resistance mechanisms arise and what we can do about them. And finally, so yeah, we'll thank talk you. a lot about invasion. Yeah, yeah and finally, Anne. Hi, I'm Dr. Ann Estes. I'm an assistant professor at Towson University where I teach general microbiology in unusual ways as you can probably think. I'm also a blogger at mostlymicrobes.com where I first started as a postdoc because um, I really am excited about getting science out to the general public. And uh, my research program focuses on insect microbial uh, systems as well. I study dung beetles and the microbes that live inside of them asking questions not only about how on earth do these microbes live in something that feeds on poop, but um, how they can handle this huge metamorphosis as the, insect, as the beetles go through pupation. And then with an applied side, we're hoping to find some microbes that would be good for biofuel so we can turn poop into energy. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so Let's get in started. Ted, you got some slides that have some really compelling visuals uh, on, on that. So go ahead and uh, I, I, you know, go ahead and share. You're muted. All right. So you can hear me now and see my slide. Yep. Okay, so um, first off, um, there are a couple of different, there are a couple of terms that are thrown around interchangeably, but they're not really, they're not the same. The first is non-native species, and that's species that um, are introduced outside their native range and um, to a new place. And, and usually uh, those are by humans, uh, which is, uh, they're up to 50,000 times what, uh, the background um, introduction is uh, because humans are moving things all over the world, and that includes um, invasive, that includes um, alien plants and diseases. Um, invasive species are a small subset of those, maybe one percent that of non-native species that acclimatize to this new habitat. They grow and reproduce rapidly and displace native species, often causing significant harm to the local ecology uh, and economy. They um, can disturb the areas where they're present. Oops, where's my uh, part here? So here's the classic example, uh, kudzu. Call, which is also known as the vine that swallowed the south. Um, it grows incredibly fast and unfortunately it has made its way to Maryland. It will cover and kill everything that can't move out of the way. Uh, you can see this poor guy is just not fast enough. Then there's cheatgrass, another horrible invader. It's invaded vast areas of the western U.S. and uh, it increases forest fires, it, um, it increases fire susceptibility. Um, then there's the chestnut blight. The American chestnut was once one of the most common trees in the Appalachians, but um, the chestnut blight, which is a fungus introduced from China, wiped it out completely in a few decades. Uh, then there's the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is killing hemlock trees in large numbers. Uh, and it's expected that the adelgid will move north as temperatures warm um, 
uh, we have our family has property up in northern Pennsylvania, New York border. And when I went there um, a couple weeks ago, I saw some where well, there hadn't been any earlier. Very sad. Uh, white nose syndrome, it's a fungus that wakes bats from hibernation and causes them to starve to death. It arrived from Europe or Asia, probably Europe in 2006, and has since spread across the US, killed, killing millions of bats, up to 100% in some caves. Um, so some of the negative impacts of invasive species, it impacts ecosystems by altering the disturbance regimes, or the hydrology um, or erosion or sedimentation, they can alter the soil chemistry. Um, earthworms are like night crawlers are an example of this north of the area where that was previously glaciated where they're not native. Um, they can cause uh, habitat and community changes uh, because by dominating by wiping out or displacing native species, they can cause the entire ecosystem to change. Uh, they can cause genetic impacts. And um, uh, they are one of the major drivers of extinction of species in the world. Uh, and they cause billions of dollars in economic impacts in agri as agricultural pests killing trees, lost recreation opportunity. These are some hemlocks killed by uh, the woolly adelgids. So what allows invaders to invade? Um, only about 1% of, of novel species will, uh, will survive at a new location, establish themselves and become invasive and dominate a new community. Nevertheless, 1% of the thousands of species that have been introduced in the US, there's several hundred um, invasive species, invasive plants, animals, uh, fungi, and whatnot, um, many of which dominate the new community where they arrive and have some causing the extinction of native species like the American chestnut, functionally extinct. Uh, invasive exotic plants characteristics. They have a broad environmental tolerance. Uh, they can take advantage of disturbances and readily adapt to local conditions. They grow quickly, they mature quickly, they produce a lot of seeds. They're very successful at dispersing their seeds. Their seeds germinate quickly and colonize. Um, they have an early leaf out. Uh, a lot of our, in the uh, mid-Atlantic, um, a lot of the invasive shrubs will leaf out and vines will leaf out before the native ones and they will get a competitive advantage yeah. that way. Ted, if you don't mind, if I break in here for just sure. a second, this is not, this is not an, an inclusive list, nor is it, nor is it, no. is, is it common features of all of them. Am I correct? That, that's correct. It's just some characteristics of, of invasive plants. And one of the key here is that they lack the natural predators, diseases, and pathogens that were keeping them in check and they're where they came from, where they're native to. So now they can just run amok. Um, they often can outcompete native species because they um, because of these generalist colonizing properties. And an interesting thing is that um, they will not only adapt, they will adapt genetically and become even stronger invaders. Um, so they become more fit and more invasive. Um, and uh, climate change is making the problem worse because a warming climate is allowing some species that could not be established historically to become established. Um, it's changing the distribution. I mentioned the hemlock woolly adelgid, it's moving north. Um, there are a lot of other invasive um, plants and fungi and insects that are expanding their range. Um, there are some native species that have become invasive and serious problems like the um, like some of the bark beetles out west. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a longer growing season also helps some of these invasive shrubs. Um, so, so what's the strategy to prevent them? So first you want to try to prevent them from being arriving 
where you are in the first place. So there are um, Fish and Wildlife um, and um, many other governments have protocols to um, prevent uh, invasive species from entering in the first place. Of course, we know that hasn't been very successful. The next step as they're introduced to eradicate them, try to eradicate them, um, like it's being done with the murder hornets in Washington state, uh, because they've just arrived at one place. Um, I've got a really funny video, but I don't have time to show you the praying man is killing a, um, killing a murder hornet. Um, often that won't work. And then the best thing you can do is damage control and try to keep them from invading sensitive areas or pristine, semi-pristine areas and keep them out of those areas. So that's a triage um, attempt. Um, this is my example of invasive species in the literature. Um, David Gerald's War Against the Couture series, which he hasn't completed yet, but it is an outstanding fictional description of an alien ecological invasion, starting with plagues that kill 60% of humanity. And then um, the survivors discover that hundreds of alien plant and animal species have begun to entrench themselves and they're all um, aggressive, opportunistic, invasive species, just like the ones um, that uh, we see in real life on earth. And um, I will turn it back over. Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a great intro to, to the overall phenomenon here. Um, so, you know, the, and I, I I sent out some questions earlier, and, and and what what kind of you've listed some of those properties that are that are really bad. So, what what would you be your worst case scenario for an invasive species in fiction? Um, if you were to invent an invasive species, what would you what would you make it do? Plagues are pretty good, um, as we've discovered over the past year and a half. Um, but plagues that are much more lethal. Um, in the real world, the chestnut blight was successful in completely exterminating. A species. Um, there are chestnuts left. They sprout from the root, but they they're killed before they get um, old enough to produce seeds of their own. Um, the kudzu is probably a mile a minute, or but especially kudzu is just so fast growing and um, so over prolific that uh, it's like a killing machine. So most. Most um, invasive vines will not kill the trees. They'll climb up trees and they'll get high enough where they can get light and they can broadcast their seeds. But kudzu will just completely cover the tree and kill yeah. it. It doesn't care. It's just devastating. Um, all right, so great, thanks. I appreciate appreciate that. And we'll, uh, I'll, I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the chat as well. Um, so Julie, over to you. Can you describe what, I, mean, I know you gave a talk on this, this earlier today, but for those who might not have been involved in this, uh, why is the woody allergen, uh, not the woody allergen, but the, uh, the, the spotted lanternfly of such great concern? Just a couple sentences, and why is it so invasive? Right, so, so basically the, the spotted lanternfly is a sap feeding insect, so kind of like an adelgid in that sense, but it feeds extremely broadly. So in terms of like the, the features of a, a damaging invasive that, that Ted illustrated, something that has broad tolerance, in this case, it has broad tolerance in terms of being able to feed on over 70 different species, plus more of, of plants and shrubs and trees. And, and what, so- yeah. what, makes it, what makes it so tolerant or what makes, what makes uh, native species so, so specialized sometimes in terms of what they can eat and what they can't eat and, and other native and alien species coming in. Why can't some of them get established? Well, well, basically here, I think, I think that if you look at sap feeding insects, um, you have some, like in the case of adelgids and whatnot, that are highly specialized to maybe a certain species of tree, you know, or certain habitat. And, and, you know, it's, Adelgids have symbionts, but plant hoppers in this case have multiple bacterial symbionts that essentially feed them from the inside out. And so plant sap is a very nutrient poor resource. And so we have a lot of invasives that can feed on plant sap. And, and the reason that um, plant sap is a viable food source is because hemiptera, many you know, insects are in this mm -hmm. order hemiptera, they've co-evolved relationships with what 
are now obligate bacterial species that they actually house in organs in their body. And so that makes, you know, we need amino acids to build our proteins. And so these guys have these bacteria that get transmitted, you know, through their eggs and only these bacteria can't exist outside the insect any longer. You know, you try to grow them out on a plate and their genomes are so eroded that you can't even grow them. And they're essentially feeding these insects from the inside out. And in the case of spotted lanternfly, um, it has three different species of bacteria that it has co-evolved with um, over tens and in one case over 200 million years. And so, you know, that allows you to be able to feed on a lot of different things. And so I think that, um, so spotted lanternfly is, is a problem because it's doing direct damage in vineyards, it's killing grapevines. But the other place where it's doing a lot of damage in thinking of your question of what are other examples in the science fiction literature, this might be low hanging fruit, but I think of the trouble with tribbles from, from Star Trek, right? Because you have these things that, well, okay, I think lanternflies are cute, they're beautiful insects, but I mean, they look really innocuous. You know, our great viticulturists used to say that harsh language would kill them. You know, many things kill them. It's very easy to kill them. They go through one generation a year. Like, how can this beast be a problem? And it's a problem because it feeds so broadly. It's not constrained to just one type of tree species. It's in agricultural habitat, suburban, residential, you know, managed in natural forests. And so they just get into everything. And so the other industries that are having problems with them, besides homeowners, right, uh, our, our nurseries and uh, Christmas tree growers, because these darn things get into the material these folks are trying to ship. And the last thing they want to feed on are conifers. They won't touch those in terms of feeding. But if they get stuck in there, whole shipments of, you know, a, a truckload of Christmas trees, that's, you know, a, a hundred bucks a tree, how many, you know, 3000 trees on a truck gets turned around, that's a lot of money that a grower would lose if there's one lanternfly egg case found on a Christmas tree. And so it's it's such a problem because hitting across all of these different habitats, it touches really everything. Yeah, so you're really talking about a generalized, um, you know, a, a, something that can, that can eat a lot of different things and, and is very versatile. Mm -hmm. So you got that. So. You mentioned the you mentioned the tribbles. Now, yep. what do they eat? Why are they so successful? Well, what I, I know that they were <laughs> feeding on feeding on grain, right? And and a shipment that that grain was poisoned, and that's how we knew that you know they were dying because that grain was poisoned. But basically, the the issue with the tribbles was kind of like with lanternfly. You have a high reproductive rate, and I think that's also something that that Ted indicated. And so so basically. You know, lanternflies only go through one generation a year, but they'll lay one egg case that's between 40 and 60 eggs. And, and if you, if it takes, you know, one male and one female, <laughs> you know, any more than two increases the population, right? And we, and we know that lanternfly lay typically more than one egg mass as well. Yeah. And so it's that high reproduction rate that, that is the triple problem. All right. Thanks. Um, okay, Adrian. Uh, you know, you study you study cancer, and your lab studies cancer. How does that how does that phenomenon exhibit similarities to an invasive invasive species? Well, you can look at it on a whole body level when a tumor grows and and spreads to other parts of the body, or even just grows really large and displaces normal organs um, and normal functions. Then people often say they feel like they're being eaten alive by their cancer. Um, you can also think of it on the cellular level. So cells have normally really good controls to make sure that they're not growing on top of each other or pushing each other aside or going one into the next. But um, when a cell turns cancerous, then it can literally push into other parts of the body either directly by directly invading um, from one cell layer into another um, and it can also metastasize or spread through the blood or through the lymph nodes of the lymph lymphatic system. Um, and cells also have ways of delivering information to other cells, sometimes physical ways, like things that are similar to tunneling nanotubes, um, where they can push DNA and RNA and protein from one cell to another. And that's definitely invasive when it's normally functioning it's intended to be useful. And when it gets, you know, when it turns rogue, then 
all the normal controls are off and it just goes haywire. And so the, the whole being eaten from within story is, is really the story of cancer and, and how invasive cancer cells can just take over everything. So for example, you see cancer patients in the end stages are often very thin because the cancer is feeding preferentially before the rest of the body. And, so, I, and yeah, that goes, to, and, and in metastasis, that's, that itself is, is, you know, is, and that's what you're talking about here when you, when it, when it spreads throughout. Yeah. So if it's locally spreading, that's often literally direct invasion. So pushing, mm -hmm. you know, like, like a push into, you know, Poland, um, or, but metastasis is, is seeding distant areas um, that aren't necessarily right next to the site where the original cancer started to grow. And so that's a, a fancier kind of invasion that's not direct. And how is, so in that ecology, and you're talking about the, the, human, the human organism as an ecology, and, and mm -hmm. we'll get more of that when we talk to Anne in a second, but you're talking about our cells as participating in a, in a local and, and regional and Yep. organism-wide ecology, what's happening? Uh, it, it, what, how are they escaping the controls, the, you know, the, the checks and balances on, on, on their growth? Yeah, so, so you can think of the body as a car or the cell as a car, whatever level you want, and you can have either too much accelerator and not enough brake. And most times in cancers, both of those things are happening. You have too much cancer that where a protein or some function that's normally promoting growth, um, but under a controlled scenario, is all the negative controls are turned off. And so it's just pushing, 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 pushing always towards excessive growth. And then you have other systems that are meant to keep control of the cellular car by applying brakes, and those are called tumor suppressors. And if you lose those, then you don't have brakes anymore. And the combination of you know, losing the break on growth and having excess growth means that the aberrant cells that are normally supposed to be killing themselves by suicide, they recognize, oh, something's wrong here, I have to stop. Those survival mechanisms are pushed and the death mechanisms are stopped and you have this uncontrolled growth and you also have, um, there's, there's physical space that is normally the boundaries um, are very well defined in your body. And when cancer happens, those boundaries are either disrupted or erased entirely. And that's how you get invasion either locally or, or distant metastasis. They're, they're all there, kinds of there, ways the just, structure is disrupted as well as the function. Uh -huh. Right. Is there an analogous, uh, so you're talking about ecological dis, you know, disruption of the fabric of that ecosystem in there. Is there an analogy in cancer as a phenomenon to the predator-prey relationship, for example, um, that, that is that the escape, you know, if you have a, a, an invading cell that, or an invading organism that no longer has predators or prey, is there an analogous situation to that in, in cancers? Well, I, I guess you could argue that the normal controls that keep everything functioning um, no, normally are no longer present. And so it's like if you have um, a pesticide that's keeping some creature um, unable to feed on your crop and now the, the pest becomes resistant to the pesticide. So you could argue that that's what's happening in cancer where the normal controls that you would use to keep it tamped down don't work anymore because the brakes are gone. Sometimes it's because signals get overridden and it receives the signal, the cell, the cancer cell receives the signal, but doesn't do anything about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> ignores it, if you will. Sometimes it becomes deaf to the signal and blind to the signal. Sometimes the immune system can come and kill off something that it can be recognized. And so immunotherapy is based on that, but escape from immunotherapy happens when cancer cells hide their signals as being different. And so that's a way in which you can consider the cancer cell as prey that escapes from the predator, which is the immune system. And one question becomes, how do you, how do you make it visible again? Now, 
Again, there's one question in the chat um, about uh, cancers triggered. What about cancers triggered by viruses? Is, mm -hmm. that, a, is that another uh, similar? That is a thing. That is a thing. So there are, um, for example, there's a, a fairly common cancer called Burkitt's lymphoma, um, particularly in Africa and parts of China. Um, it's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, which is exactly the same thing that almost all of us have in our bodies that cause mononucleosis. But in, in the case of these cancers, um, what's happened is that the virus has co-opted certain normal cell functions. And so those controls that I mentioned that normally will stop a cell from just dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing, um, those controls that the cell isn't responsive to those controls anymore because of the presence of the virus. And Thanks. yeah, that, that can happen in, in, with several different viruses that we know about that can cause cancer through disruption right. of control systems. One last question before we go to Anne. What's your favorite uh, fictional uh, invasive species? So this is sort of not in the spirit of what we're talking about here in the sense that the ones in Arrival, um, I like those best because in part, they seem like superior beings that have this incredible art that they use to communicate with. Um, and so that's, that's my favorite. Okay. All right. Moving on. I'm being Zoom bombed here. My daughter's in the background. So Eleanor, can you please? Can you please? Invasive species. <laughs> yes, invasive. Exactly. I'm hungry. All right. Oh, if you're hungry. Oh, go. Go find your pistachios or something like that, um, <laughs> or these. Anyway, um, give me a second. Um, Anne, you got an interesting hat on there. What is it? Oh, thank you. This is my dysbiosis hat. So, what is a dysbiosis? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, a dysbiosis I illustrate by my shirt. So, <laughs> this is your gut. We have gut lining here, and we normally have all these great bacteria in our gut. E. coli is one that, you know, maybe you think is a bad thing, but actually it makes your vitamin K. But the problem is when we get some invasive species in here, it's going to break down some of your gut epithelial lining and cause a problem. And so what causes problems? Well, having things like french fries and candy and hot dogs and lots of processed foods. So all those things can throw off your gut bacteria. And when that happens, it's a dysbiosis, people get sick. And that also is when this little friend, Clostridium difficile can come in. And I like Clostridium difficile. I really respect this group of organisms because they make these amazing spores. So it's kind of like a seed, but better. Um, in that they've got all these layers and layers and layers. I didn't clearly um, get my hat uh, weighted properly. That keeps shifting, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, but with Clostridium difficile and other bacillus, they make spores where it's just DNA in, you know, their instructions in the cell and it's layers and layers and layers of proteins and amino acids and also um, cellulose and sometimes in some organisms, a little bit of chitinous material. But all those layers are like jackets that protect that spore. And we know that some of the, um, some of the bacillus spores have lived uh, or have been, uh, will grow again after they've been trapped in the gut of an insect in amber for 30,000 years. We can still get these bacillus spores to grow. Clostridium difficile is the same way. So if we have antibiotics, which is represented here, then um, that can also disrupt our gut microbiome. But spores can survive. They're not actively growing, so the antibiotics can't kill them. And so as soon as the antibiotics go away, the spores can hatch, you know, kind of like any good invasive alien egg, and then start growing again. So, Some of these, I mean, spores are really amazing. I mean, my, they are late these days. So um, they are truly incredible. I mean, you can put these things out on the surface of the International Space Station. Yeah. 
And at the end of this, at the end of the voyage, you can bring them back and yep. recover viable spores. I mean, yeah. literally nuke them from orbit. Yeah. Uh, I thought we nuked TB a lot, Adrian, uh, when we were when we were, I was doing that in, in your lab, uh, you know, a, a number of years ago. They don't hold a candle in resistance to these spores. Yep. And you can, you know, it, it's it's amazing. And so, like. Like Mike just said, they're, they're a lot like tardigrades, right? And mm -hmm. mention that, that now too. And it's because both of these things, they've pulled all the water out of the, the package. So now we just have that nucleic acid and DNA is insanely stable. So, you know, when we've got all that protection in there and no water, then we've got, um, you know, we've got a really good recipe for survival. So um, that's what, so a lot of times people will get Clostridium difficile infections after they've had really strong antibiotics, they've wiped out all their native good bacteria um, that are helping break down their food and making their vitamins, and then uh, Clostridium can come in. And so that's another aspect that I really think of when I'm thinking about my dung beetles or uh, the human gut system is it's all about your neighbors. So. It's having that, thanks. <laughs> it's having that, that disruption. I had to live in an apartment building for a little bit because of a house fire and we had horrible neighbors. And, you know, it brought that point home more and more. You know, if you've got an open space, if you have an open hotel room, you have an open apartment building, anybody can get in. You want good neighbors. And so, it's having that niche open that also allows for our kudzu, right? We're gonna see a lot of uh, honeysuckle and things like that in disturbed areas. So, you know, that's something else I think we need to think about a lot is disturbance, which we humans are good at, is what really triggers a lot of these invasive events, whether they're with, you know, microbes or whether they're with eukaryotes. So how, how in the case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, ask a question here, both of you and of, of Adrian. Um, how are these sorts of invasions managed? Now, how do we how do we control the the invasions, both in in or in cancer and in in, in uh, microbial dysbiosis? So, I'm going to start with Adrian. So, basically, the idea is to get some kind of targeted drug that can turn off the function that is gone awry. Um, it's much easier to turn off an oncogene or cancer causing gene than it is to turn, turn on a tumor suppressor. Um, so drugs that are now on the market based on basic science from 10, 20, 30 years ago are finally starting to be able to very specifically block um, some of these functions, which is very exciting for those of us who've been in science for a while and, and hoping that there will be some spillover translationally. Great, so we have a, we have a pesticide there. Um, what about uh, what about in in C diff or other in microbial invasions like that? Well, yeah. So this is the the fun story of C diff, right? Is that um, if you want a cure for C diff, what do you do? You repopulate. Yes, yeah, said populate. You give fecal transplants. So you put that nice, great community from a healthy person um, into your gut again, and you bring those nice neighbors home, which, you know, all, is also something that I remember my wetland biology teacher, Dr. Folkert's always said, when you want to reestablish a wetland, go grab a whole bunch of leaf litter and, and, uh, detritus effectively, you know, from another wetland that's healthy and stick it in. And then you're bringing back all the life. So yeah, fecal transplants are insane for C. diff. They have a, uh, uh, a cure rate of 95 to uh, 95 to 97%. So that's pretty impressive. Hasn't, we really haven't gotten the fecal transplants working for other things yet, but um, it's amazing for C. diff. Okay. Don't like dogs like to eat poop? Yep. And deer Good possibility. And, and I, rabbits. I'm gonna, I'm gonna... I want to head back to, to Julie and Ted for a second and, and talk to so Julie, um, what kind of what kind of strategies are there to mitigate or or uh, or, rest, or you know, eliminate the uh, the spotted lanternfly and other kinds of insect uh, insect pests like that invasive insects? 
Well, one, uh, we don't have a silver bullet yet. It's going to take a lot of a lot of different tools working together. But one has been like following this theme of disturbance um, contributes to further disturbance. Um, basically, one of uh, Lanternfly's preferred hosts is the introduced invasive uh, tree of heaven or Atlantis altissima that grows in highly disturbed habitats, which are along highways and rail line corridors, which really open up the country for spread of lanternfly. And so the original, um, so the original uh, approach to treatment that Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and other states departments of ag and USDA have taken is to try to control um, spotted lanternfly on that tree. So they use tree of heaven removal and otherwise then the remaining tree of heaven, they would take out like 90% of tree of heaven on property and then treat the remain, remaining tree of heaven with a systemic insecticide. So that's one that the plant tissue takes up and there you're only um, targeting those arthropods that feed on the tissue rather than something that's like a knockdown contact that'll give you arachnophobia and kill everything. You know, it's a little bit more specific and they targeted tree of heaven because as an introduced species, a lot of native arthropods don't use it. it they haven't co-evolved with it. And so this was kind of like a nice fine-tuned way to really try to only direct your nastiest compounds toward tree of heaven and lanternfly, but it's, it's not enough. I mean, they did that from day one and we see that this thing is out of the bag a little bit. And so continuing to treat this, it, basically, you know, one invasive, contributes more disturbance and opens a pathway for the next, for the next, for the next. And so I kind of feel like that's why we're always playing catch up in a sense. Ted, how can that's you- That's a really good strategy though, to um, to start with Tree of Heaven as your test plant, because uh, you don't care if it dies. Yeah. <laughs> right, so Ted, and can you talk about some of the efforts to restore um, damaged e or ecosystems that have been damaged through uh, invasive species? So one of the, probably the biggest problem why invasive species are out of control is a lack of funding and attention. Um, there is just a tiny fraction of the amount of funding that's needed to take these problems seriously, to like seriously inspect uh, cargo and to do ecological restoration to the degree needed and to control um, pests. But it's in the it's in the country's interest to do that because the impact, the economic impact is in the billions of dollars. And then there's the ecological impact too. And, um, and ecosystems provide us uh, services, which also is in the billions and billions of dollars. So some uh, um, things that can be done, um, uh, just remove, re well, where they're, in, where they're infested, then you spray them um, with, with a spray that won't uh, persist, but um, that's the most cost-effective way to do it. And then uh, you need to replant or broadcast native seeds so that you don't have an open area that is just open for invasion again. Uh, so that's um, one thing. And then, so there have been some, um, and another thing that's been used is bringing in some predator controls uh, from where the plant is uh, native from or where the uh, other or organism is native. And um, so introduce those or, or genetically modify an organism and you have to test these really, really thoroughly to make sure that you don't have unintended consequences because we're humans are really good at trying to fix one problem and starting lots of new problems with that first fix. Um, that's why we have a lot of these invasive species to begin with where um, like a lot of them were introduced to control, um, to control erosion and things like that. You're muted. I'm muted. Thank you. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, the first is uh, from Henry Meyer. Uh, are wild grapevines and honeysuckle invasives? <laughs> um, well, why, yes, they are. <laughs> well, let me uh, turn my, I brought in some uh, video here for show and tell. I was going to say, no wonder lanternfly likes them so yeah. much. 
<laughs> yeah, so so here's some um, Japanese honeysuckle from my my backyard. Um, it smells kind of good, but they grow. I don't they probably grow a foot a week. Um, what was the other one? Wild grapevines. Um, they are, so that's a, a a native. You could call it perhaps invasive in, in that they will readily colonize disturbed areas. Uh, but the thing about grapevines is that they will not, if they go in a tree, they won't kill the tree because they won't overtop it, unlike uh, kudzu and some other, an oriental bitter seed. Um, here's my, um, one of my least favorite invaders, uh, English ivy. And um, one of the uh, grapevines is, is, one of the worst grapevines is actually porcelain berry. That is a non-native vitus species. So here's a porcelain berry for you. That looks like you really feel, Sandy. <laughs> is that from China, Ted? I believe so, yeah. Okay. A lot of these, uh, I think a lot of these species came in because they're pretty. <laughs> because they're pretty. Ornamentals. Yeah, everyone wants English ivy. It looks so stately and makes them feel like an English manor lord. So I've got a um, I've got a, a couple more questions. The first is is Roundup long term toxic? Um, there's some controversy about that. I'm I'm a I'm a biochemist and chemical chemical bio biochemical defense uh, guy. So I may take some of that. Long Roundup does not persist in the soil. It, it does not last very long in the soil. If it's taken up by the plant, uh, it's also chemically quite similar to a nut, to an actual natural product. That's produced by soil bacteria, um, you know, quite quite similar. So there are already things running around out there that are, are similar to that. Whether it's, you know, whether it does not seem to have, to my knowledge, a, a, a proven toxicity uh, in in humans. That said, it does go into the the ecosystem for at least the time being, and we run the risk of isolating Roundup resistant weeds and in other invasive species like that. So. Yeah. yeah, you have to be um, careful with any sort of chemical control, um, just like you have to be with antibiotics in that um, you may be uh, causing a mutation or you may, a mutation may be favored that is resistant to that control. That's okay, we have one more question in the chat um, and I want to do a round robin on this one real quick because um, we only have a couple minutes or so to go. So how might invasive species change an ecosystem in the long run along the lines of centuries? And we'll start with Anne in this one. Wait, I get the kicker, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it shifts. So actually this has happened in humans, right? Because we have done a lot to change our gut microbiome. We've used antibiotics, we're super sterile. We have uh, things like C-section that have really destroyed a lot of our native gut microbiome. And so it has caused this epidemic of obesity, diabetes, and a lot of autoimmune diseases. So what can it do in the, on the sca uh, scale of centuries? Well, it can damage our health when it's a microbial perspective. Okay, uh, Adrian. Yeah, I guess from the cancer perspective, it's more like how do cells and, and organisms evolve in order to try to escape cancer. Um, and one of the things that we're doing when we monkey around with aging is also monkey around with the exact same um, protective mechanisms that are supposed to work against cancer. So beware of things that are supposed to promote 150, 200 year lives, I guess. Something to be careful on the generation ships, right? <laughs> exactly. All right, Julie. I mean, it, it uh, invasive species uh, make environments more homogenous, right? You lose, you lose species diversity. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're losing those special relationships that exist where multiple species keep each other in balance, you know, co-evolutionary relationships. And, and so you can even see it in your yard. Somebody mentioned starlings and cowbirds and things where you, you lose your buntings, you lose your grosbeaks. And so in the long haul, we'll lose species. And the more species you lose, um, the more, uh, the less resilient the ecosystem is because uh, each species is uniquely adapted to 
transform uh, and use energy and they are all interdependent uh, ecosystems are all interdependent you take pieces away and then um, uh, it's it's not stable anymore um, so we were talking about human Anne and Adrian were talking about humans humans are the ultimate invasive species we've invaded the entire globe and we have transformed it beyond recognition um, I'm not saying that humans should leave the planet and go colonize another one, um, but although that would be nice, um, if, at least if we colonized another, another planet. Um, but uh, hey, we I'm, do... I have to call it and wrap, wrap up. Thank okay. you so much. We're at time. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone here uh, for their participating in the panel. And I hope that, that this has been for the audience uh, informative and, and, uh, and enjoyable. It's been a lot of fun for me. So again, thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. All right, y'all take bye. care. Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for hosting.